Cryptocurrency's continued adoption has turned up the heat on governments around the world. Their reckless money printing has only added fuel to the fire, and now they're rushing to develop their central bank digital currencies before it's too late. Today, I'm going to explore a recent report which reveals what features CBDCs will have, how governments plan on rolling them out, and what implications this could have for cryptocurrency. Now, I hate to make you wait, but I need to set the record straight. Financial advice is great, but you won't find any here, mate. This video is only meant to entertain and educate. If this is the first time you hear my dank rhymes, my name is Guy, and this channel is where fiat comes to die. That's because the Coin Bureau contains the highest quality content about crypto, which is fiat's arch enemy, if you didn't already know. Coins, tokens, news, reviews, exchanges, tutorials, and regulations are just a few of the languages I speak. If this is the kind of knowledge you seek, subscribe to the channel and ping that notification bell to build your financial physique. I value your time, which is why I've left timestamps below that you can use to skip ahead to any interesting topics you find. If you watch until the end, though, that would be mighty fine. So that's all you need to know about me. So let's dig in to some CBDCs. The report I'll be discussing today was put together by the Bank of International Settlements. Now, for those unfamiliar, the Bank of International Settlements, or BIS, is the, quote, bank for central banks. And its primary role is to facilitate coordination between central banks around the world. Over the last few years, the BIS has been hammering out a template for central bank digital currencies. And if the name didn't give it away, well, central bank digital currencies, or CBDCs, are digital currencies issued by their respective central banks. Duh. Note that CBDCs are not cryptocurrencies by any stretch of the definition. This is because CBDCs are centralized, permissioned, and offer next to no privacy. CBDCs are completely controlled by central banks and the governments they are beholden to. Almost every central bank is working on a CBDC of its own, and seven of these central banks have been actively helping the BIS hammer out a CBDC template. These are the United States Federal Reserve, the European Central Bank, the Bank of England, the Bank of Japan, the Swiss National Bank, the Bank of Canada, and the Swedish Central Bank. Back in October 2020, these seven central banks and the BIS published the first of many reports about what CBDCs will look like. The second CBDC report came out on September the 30th, and that's the one I'll be covering today. This report contains even more details about what CBDCs will look like, and it's divided into three parts. System design and interoperability, user needs and adoption, and financial stability implications. The authors provided a short six-page summary of their three-part CBDC report, and there are a few interesting points in the summary which were seemingly not mentioned in the three sections of the report. The very first thing worth pointing out is the most important, and that's that everything you're about to hear applies to a public or retail CBDC. Now, this is a small but insanely significant detail because central banks, governments, and select institutions will use their own so-called wholesale CBDCs. A wholesale CBDC template is also being hammered out, but one thing is clear as day. Regular folks like us will use a completely different digital currency to the people in power. Let that sink in. Now, another concerning detail that can be found at the end of the very first page of the report summary, and that is, quote, CBDCs would be likely to have wide-ranging impacts on public policy issues beyond a central bank's traditional remit. This seems to imply that CBDCs will be used to enforce public policy mandates which are not financial in nature. But wait, there's more. Quote, Different users and needs would need to be defined and addressed in the system's design. And, quote, central banks might consider measures to influence or control CBDC adoption or use. This could include measures such as access criteria for permitted users. This suggests that even retail CBDCs will have different rules for different groups of people. 
Now, if you're starting to feel upset, don't worry. The BIS and these central banks know that, quote, there might be some measures that may face obstacles to public understanding and acceptance. I'll tell you how they plan on helping you understand and accept these terms and conditions in just a moment. But first, let's start with how these CBDCs will be designed. Much of how CBDCs will be designed has to do with what roles the current financial intermediaries will play in such a system. For starters, quote, central banks would be the only entities entitled to issue and redeem a CBDC and would bear the ultimate responsibility for the design of the CBD system and the operation slash oversight of the core ledger. Now, although central banks could theoretically cut out all existing financial intermediaries, the report stresses the importance of partnering with the private sector, simply because the central bank can't possibly recreate, much less maintain, the same infrastructure on its own. If it helps, here's an image of what the financial system looks like now in most countries. And here's what a CBDC-based financial system would look like according to the report. As you can see, the exact role each party plays here is not entirely clear, but the report notes that, quote, if the central bank were to play too operational or dominant a role in the ecosystem, private intermediary participation could be curtailed. Given that private financial intermediaries are going to be a part of the picture, this means CBDCs will need to be interoperable, not just internationally, but also domestically with their existing infrastructure. Because this will likely cause a lot of technical issues, the report recommends limiting the number of financial intermediaries that are allowed to operate. Also, quote, approval processes for new intermediaries or certain services and strong oversight could help mitigate technical issues. Meaning the central bank will decide exactly which financial intermediaries are allowed to operate. When it comes to privacy, quote, full anonymity is not possible, as central banks would design CBDC systems to meet anti-money laundering and combating the financing of terrorism requirements. Thankfully, your data will be safe, because, quote, the central bank would have no commercial interest in end-user data and may be better placed than a commercial entity to commit to a minimal use of such data. What a relief! Now, the report also brings up the infamous travel rule put in place by the FATF, which means that every CBDC transaction above a certain amount would be automatically tracked. If you don't know what the FATF is and what it's got planned for crypto in the coming weeks, be sure to watch my video about that using the link up in the top right. I digress. The next part of the report briefly touches on the interoperability requirement for CBDCs and notes that, quote, the essential foundation of interoperability would be standardization, which would allow compatibility. The last thing the report mentions about interoperability is, quote, a CBDC could be introduced with an explicit policy goal to catalyze a migration of national standards to, e.g., an internationally promoted standard. Put differently, CBDC standards will be global. I, for one, cannot wait. This brings me to the moment you've all been waiting for, and that's the part of the BIS report that explains how central banks and governments can convince us plebs to adopt their CBDCs. Make sure you've got enough popcorn. It starts off by not so subtly admitting that the main reason why central banks are developing CBDCs is because of cryptocurrency adoption. Quote, Without continued innovation and competition to drive efficiency in a jurisdiction's payment system, users may adopt other, less safe instruments or currencies, potentially leading to economic and consumer harm. Even though central banks can see the writing on the wall, the report seems to imply that rolling out CBDCs too quickly could do more harm than good. This is fleshed out more in the third part of the report, which I'll get into later. Now, ironically, the report acknowledges that, quote, technological innovation has been transforming the markets for retail payments at pace over recent years, with many new payment methods, platforms, and interfaces evolving to become faster, cheaper, and safer. The logical conclusion of this kind of statement would be to allow this kind of payment innovation to continue, but apparently the BIS and its banker buddies believe this is better done in a different way. Now, the report then outlines the three ways by which CBDC adoption can be achieved. By fulfilling unmet user needs, achieving network effects, 
and not requiring everyone to buy a new computer or phone. How exactly CBDCs fulfill unmet user needs is detailed a little later on. And according to the BIS, the main selling points here are security, low cost, high liquidity, programmability, and privacy. <laughs> Sorry. Now, in terms of achieving network effects, the report suggests, quote, CBDC design could choose to emphasize peer-to-peer -peer functionality in order to facilitate adoption. This recommendation is based on existing research on the adoption of digital currencies, but I don't think the authors realize that they're not exactly comparing apples with apples here. Not requiring everyone to buy a new device is pretty self-explanatory, though it comes with its own set of issues related to performance, because the most widespread technologies are the most basic. As the report goes on, it starts to detail some more manipulative ways of achieving CBDC adoption, namely, quote, incentivize consumer use of CBDC by dispersing social benefits and transfers to individuals in CBDC, and, quote, allowing consumers to pay their taxes in CBDC may also provide a stable, concrete example for consumers to use CBDC. On page 11, the report provides a sort of rubric for various CBDC marketing campaigns targeting consumers with different pain points and needs. The funny thing is that one of these consumer archetypes is a person, quote, who does not want commercial banks to know his or her identity or track his or her spending. Naturally, the best solution to this issue is to give all that information directly to the central bank instead. Now, I reckon the ideal middle ground would be to offer both transparency and compliant privacy the way Secret Network does. And you can learn more about that using the link up in the top right. So, this leaves just one part of the BS report, sorry, BIS report, and that's the financial stability implications of a CBDC. Here we see the first mention of cryptocurrency, when the report notes that, quote, stablecoins are only just starting to be developed and will need to satisfy regulators that they are safe. Well, I guess they missed the memo that stablecoins have been around for years and their users know which ones are safe and which ones are less safe. Then the report goes on to claim something so ridiculous that it pains me to even repeat it. Quote, Unlike central banks, issuers of stablecoins are not bound by principles to design products that would coexist and interoperate with other forms of money or to promote ongoing innovation and efficiency. This is categorically false as far as I'm concerned. Stablecoins like USDT and USDC are available on more than a dozen different blockchains, and it's in their economic interest to be as interoperable as possible. Stablecoins are literally leagues ahead in interoperability terms of any CBDC. Heck, even Visa has managed to test USDC as part of its own payment infrastructure. And then the truth comes out. Quote, Significant stablecoin adoption and the potential consequent fragmentation could result in excessive market power and the type of deposit disintermediation described as a risk for CBDC issuance. This officially confirms that stablecoins are seen by central banks as a risk to the rollout of a central bank digital currency. They're also hyper-aware that, quote, the actual introduction of CBDCs could be some years away. In the interim, providers of private money and tokens are expected to continue developing and expanding their service offerings. And because central banks can't possibly catch up, the only way they can slow stablecoins down is through regulation, which is probably why we're seeing headlines like these all over the place. Though the next part of the report is quite technical in nature, my interpretation is that central banks know that CBDCs can't compete with stablecoins because they can't offer the same yields on savings you find in DeFi. As I mentioned in my video about Fidelity's views on cryptocurrency, yields are something that wealthy investors and institutional investors crave, and their influence could just protect stablecoins from harsh regulations. Page 8 of the third leg of the BIS report is where things get really interesting. Besides the fact that the projected adoption of CBDCs in G20 countries is between 4 and 12%, CBDCs could pose a huge threat to the financial system via the banks. To understand why, we must go back in time. When the stock market started crashing in the lead up to the Great Depression, people scrambled to withdraw all their money from their bank accounts, only to find that their banks didn't have their money 
because it had all been lent out. These bank runs caused the banking sector to collapse, and this is what ultimately caused the Great Depression. The FDIC was created shortly afterwards to make sure that banks always had enough cash on hand to make sure bank runs could never happen again. However, the BIS report highlights the fact that a CBDC would be seen as a safe haven by many investors during a time of crisis, meaning they would move their money out of the banking system and into the central bank. This would lead to a collapse of the banking system like it did 100 years ago. Now, even if this collapse doesn't happen, the report admits that in a CBDC system, quote, a common theme is that maintaining bank profitability levels could be challenging. The report actually gives a series of recommendations for how private banks could mitigate the punch to their pocketbooks and the potential collapse it could cause, and they are laughable to say the least. Of all the side effects the report says a CBDC could have on the banking system, one of them caught my eye. Quote, The introduction of a CBDC by the central bank could cause a reduction in commercial bank deposits, which would consequently translate into more expensive credit lines. In plain English, CBDCs could make loans more expensive, and that means it could become next to impossible for the average person to buy a house or other valuable assets. Say, it's almost like you'll own nothing and be happy. Where have I heard that one before? Anyways, the same run-on-the-bank risk exists with stablecoins, and you could argue that it's already begun. The 120 plus billion in stablecoin market cap didn't come from nowhere. It came from bank balance sheets. After highlighting these risks and others, such as CBDCs potentially replacing government bonds as the primary safe haven asset among investors, the report explains how central banks can use their omnipotence to prevent these scenarios from playing out. Quote, Quantity-based safeguards would restrict the use of CBDC through imposing hard limits on the transfers and or holdings of CBDC. And, quote, limits could also be applied varyingly for different CBDC account holders. Better yet, quote, such limits could be imposed on a permanent basis or on a transitional basis. In other words, if the economy starts crashing and everyone runs to CBDCs to protect their wealth, the central bank will prevent them from doing that to prevent the crash. Investors be damned. Now, the BIS report concludes that, quote, a material shift from bank deposits to CBDC, if the holdings of CBDCs by individual users were left unconstrained, could have a non-trivial, long-term impact on bank lending and intermediation. Well, where do I sign up? As terrifying as this BIS report is, it reveals just how difficult it will be to roll out such a dystopian system. And I would argue it's next to impossible. This is simply because there's no way to introduce a CBDC without eating into the bottom line of the banks and financial intermediaries. They would sooner side with crypto than let that happen. And I have a strange feeling that this could be the outcome of the introduction of a CBDC. There is also no way in hell that the average person would adopt a CBDC without being forced. And the moment you start to use force to mandate something you claim is good, it becomes clear that it's, well, not. This begs the question of why central banks would go through all this trouble to create what is likely to be a piss-poor payment method. Well, I reckon the answer is that this isn't their actual goal, and the evidence is easily found in the design of what they're building. CBDCs are nothing short of a tool for total control, and every single stated benefit and feature only exists to entice people into this totalitarian scheme. As the report itself admitted, there are already numerous financial technologies that can do everything CBDCs can and more. Most of these financial technologies have come from cryptocurrency, and I find it odd that the report didn't mention any cryptocurrencies besides stablecoins. Now, on that note, it didn't mention the word blockchain either. I suppose the BIS doesn't want to draw any more attention to cryptocurrencies. It would be a real tragedy if any of the governments reading the report got the idea of adopting Bitcoin like El Salvador did. Other countries are likely to follow suit, especially since it's much easier to plug into a financial system that's been proven to be secure and reliable rather than build a new one from the ground up. 
It looks like they won't have any other choice either, because fiat currencies are losing value and credibility by the minute. This might actually be what the central banks want, though. After all, the only way they could possibly convince anyone to adopt their CBDCs is if their existing fiat currencies are worthless. Even then, the crash could happen much quicker than they anticipated, and their CBDCs are far from being ready to fill that void. Now, it sounds crazy, but we could end up with a scenario where the only kind of money left with any value are select cryptocurrencies and China's digital yuan. I think we all know which one the world would pick. That's just my theory, though, and I'm keen to hear yours. So, what do you think of these CBDCs? Drop me a comment down below and be sure to share this video to make sure your friends and family stay in the know. I've got a whole bunch of other videos on the go, and I also have another channel besides the Coin Bureau. Coin Bureau Clips is where you can see everything that happens here behind the scenes. You can find me on Twitter, TikTok, and Instagram too. I've been verified on the first two, and if you know how I can finally get verified on Instagram, that would be cool. I even got verified on Telegram, so you'll be able to join knowing you're not going to be scammed. You should also subscribe to my weekly newsletter, which is filled with everything but spam. And you can get yourself a hoodie or tea or beanie from my merch store if you want to rep the Coin Bureau brand. You can find your way to all these resources and more using the links just below me. Don't get lost. Thank you so much if you stuck around. It's been a pleasure as always. I'll see you again before you know it.